I know this is spissy, this is the only place that we're not supposed to do that. Um, but I, I kind of tend to cause a ruckus anywhere, but uh, fortunately I'm going to be talking about uh, low income identities. And I'm going to tell you why we picked white men, because uh, that wasn't the original thought. So when I started graduate school, this paper did with my advisor, Dr. Mij Eaton. Uh, I was really interested in race and gender research, but I told her I felt like we were missing something. And she was like, you're probably talking about social class, but I'm warning you, there's like nothing in organizational science on that. I was like, that's okay, I'll have your paper by next week. I did not, because there really wasn't. Um, so what I did find was a lot in the literature that suggested that we need more on social mobility and how starting in a lower income background and then fulfilling what we say the American dream is, right, of moving up, um, how, does this still influence your behavior? And is it at all a part of your identity? And so in doing this literature search that we're looking for, um, we could find that social class was strong enough to influence how stressful life events impact your mental health. We found really critical literature on how it influences the kind of beard that you buy. Um, but in organizational science, we mostly found that it was used as a control variable or only measured from an economic standpoint, like with what your salary was, which is really relative, depending on which part of the country you live in, right? Um, and we wanted to know, is it functioning as a social identity? Because when we looked at some of the social psychology research, we found that people were more likely to report that their subjective class identity influenced their behavior more than an objective measures such as what their salary is. Another, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the stereotype content model, um, being that people in, so I'm an industrial organizational psychology student, so we studied this model in the sense of people who are perceived as low in competence tend to be excluded from leadership positions uh, and desirable workplace positions. And we have studied this rigorously with women and people of color. We know that this stereotype is an issue. But what's interesting is that we also know that the poor and welfare recipients occupy the same sections of this model, but white men do not. White men are assumed to be competent. And so that's kind of where the white men came into play, of if there's nowhere for us to start with this literature, and we have no quantitative measures to pull off of and no social identities at work to look at, let's see if it's salient enough of an identity to where if you have at least two other privileged ones, you're white and male, do you still report this as influencing your behavior? And so today we're going to have a little chit chat about social class and how we came to look at it as a stigmatized identity, as a reason for identity management behaviors, uh, how this is a part of an intersectional identity between privileged and non-privileged, uh, and if it's concealable at all, and why you should care about this as an employer. So the interesting part about class, as compared to the rest of the stereotype content model, is you should be able to hide it. Uh, you can't hide that you're a person of color, and you usually can't hide your gender. But we did find some literature that suggested that even your speech patterns, uh, your engagement versus disengagement cues, being if you nod your head, if you smile, your facial expressions, uh, those also influence what people perceive your, your class to be, as well as the recreational activities that you're associated with, even the music you listen to. Uh, and even one recent study in 2017 found that neutral faces, people could guess what your class background was. And the thing about concealable stigmatized identities, even if these don't give it away, even if people don't know what your class background is, we know from the mental health community and from the LGBTQ community that concealing a piece of your identity at work leads to more turnover, lower job satisfaction, lower organizational commitment. And these are both a bottom line influence for employers if you don't care about people. And if you do care about people, it also really stresses them out and then they don't have jobs. So, Either way, it's kind of a problem. And so to look at this from a conceivable standpoint, we had to choose childhood social class for two reasons. One, assuming somebody has moved up, they should be able to hide their lower income, right? They should have access to more clothes, maybe more of a social network, other influencers that maybe give them a chance to hide uh, this background. But secondly, and maybe even more important, imprinting theory tells us that during sensitive periods of your life, 
Characteristics are formed, cultural influences are strong enough to impact you forever, and one of these that has been found to happen is your social class imprint as a child. Because there are class cultures that you learn during those times, and there's actually been some research to show that this might be part of the class divide, is the cultural differences between these groups. So because of this, we wanted to know, one, are people concealing their class background at work? And if so, to whom are they concealing and who are they disclosing to? Secondly, we also wanted to know, are they really able to hide it? Or do other things give it away? And so this led to what, to what I led to what I fondly recall as the Great White Man Hunt of 2017. May or may not have happened in a minivan. We'll leave that out. But where I went up and down the state of Florida uh, to interview white men who experienced social mobility. They only have to be white and male and have experience mobility. So you'll hear from people who started in poverty who are homeless or people who are lower middle class. Uh, and so we used Brown and Clark's 2006 thematic analysis to look over. And uh, because of the brevity of this presentation and that I had to get duct tape, I'm going to skip over those details, but they are in the paper. So most of our sample did report that they did conceal this low income background at work. And 95% did say that they disclose. Uh, now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into all of these in great detail. Um, but they concealed out of fear of judgment, believing that nobody wanted to hear it, said it was too personal, they didn't want pity, or they didn't want to be embarrassed or vulnerable. They disclosed mostly when they felt forced to, but also to relate to other people, to motivate or help somebody else in a similar situation, or other people notice class cues, or to become, when they had become close to somebody. For the sake of answering the research questions, I'm only going to give examples of the judgment category and the noticing class cues. But the paper's published, so you could beg me for it if you wanted to. Um, so, the number one reason for concealing was for fear of judgment, and some of these actually explicitly said they were afraid that people would think they could not do their job, which fits right into that stereotype, con stereotype content model, right? Of a lack of competence being the stereotype. And so this man, uh, I interviewed him in Key West, he was a school principal for a grade school, and he said, if I was introduced as Michael, the guy, and this, these are pseudonyms, uh, the guy who makes less than $30,000 a couple years ago, and as you know, they knew that history, oh, is this the new person that's going to take care of your children? Is that very exciting? Is it very reassuring? Maybe not. And so I do, I think there are positions in certain career fields that class or the perception of a person's class is important. And 70% of our sample uh, fit into that theme. Now, first of all, if you don't know who Alan Jackson is, we are from different class cultures. <laughs> I've had this song in my head all day ever since I've found that picture. Second of all, back to the topic, people did report noticing social class cues for multiple reasons. Uh, one of the most prominent being an accent, which I wouldn't know anything about. Um, so, but one of them from Tallahassee gave the explicit example uh, when I asked him at work how do people know about his background. And he said same things like y'all and howdy and stuff like that. Uh, people associate Southern slang with dirt poor country bumpkins. Like some of the reactions, you can just tell from the facial expressions. They give it away. You know, like the eyebrow raise or the pupils get real big. Something like that, where their body straightens up a little. Stuff like that. So back to those research questions. So first, did white men conceal this background? Uh, we have support that they did. We have support that they do manage this identity at work, that 70% of them reported concealing and mostly for a fear of judgment, uh, for being perceived as not competent to do their jobs. And second, is it completely concealable? Um, not really. So a little over a third found that it was not. And interestingly, while most did report disclosure, the really the biggest category was they felt forced to. Somebody found out some other way, or they were put in a situation they did not feel like they could get out of. So why is this important? Let's get us, why do we care? It's just white guys, right? Right. But also, we know that concealing stigmatized identities at work uh, leads to reduced sense of belonging, lower self-esteem, lower job satisfaction, which leads to higher turnover, lower organizational commitment, and also increased work stress, which is also related to all those negative outcomes, as well as physical ailments. I mean, stress does literally kill. Um, but disclosing, we know people who disclose in the um, pregnancy literature or the LGBTQ literature that they have higher job satisfaction and they feel a sense of relief. Um, imagine having an inclusive work environment. 
is good for your health. <laughs> it's really shocking. Um, so we think this is important for future research to look at the health implications, for sure, um, but also the psychological implications as well as the work outcomes. Um, we know that other identities have increased work fatigue, reduced job performance, and motivation when they are actively concealing all the time at work. Um, and the elephant in the room is how does this intersect with other identities when you don't have two other privileged identities to uh, get you through the day? Is it better? Or do people automatically assume that you're of a lower income background when you are a woman or a person of color? Um, we don't know that yet, but if anybody's dying to fund our research, we'll let you know. Um, and we also look at this from isolating the class origins, because I mean, this was everybody from homeless to lower middle class. Um, and we have found, we have done two papers after this with this data, we had a lot of data, that the, the real poverty groups versus the lower middle class groups are often not always agreeing with each other. Um, I know we're going to do questions after everybody else, but I think that's it.